every horse uh, that Trot takes in, they go out to him at the run over with a, a fine tooth comb uh, to see what type of vocation, what type of future they'll have. Uh, and I learned all this from Vince, and if Vince says it's okay, it's okay with me. But uh, introduce the uh, panel here. Uh, Mike Smith, Hall of Fame jockey, Joe Talamo. I'm going to make a prediction. Don't know how old he's going to be when it happens, but a Hall of Famer future. Kayla Straw has had a great impact and, and uh, gone up against what is probably the most difficult thing to do in Southern California, attacked one of the toughest riding colonies in the country, having good success, uh, winning races on long shots uh, from Australia. Beautiful girl, doing great right now. <laughs> Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer. Uh, slash Hall of Fame auctioneer and uh, one of the greatest guys in the business for keeping our business alive and making sure that uh, our retired racehorses have a great home and to me slash Bill Shoemaker the greatest of all time Hall of Famer Lafitte Pinkai. Um, got to tell you that this is the first time that I've been a moderator at one of these things, but I've had enough moderators to uh, on these type of things. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Mike Smith, and oh, I can see that devilish look hey, right you. there, Mikey. Testing. <laughs> <laughs> you always testing. You're always testing until the big dance happens. That's the, you're always testing. Um, we're going to do a, a Q&A uh, after we get through this whole panel right here. But, uh, Mike, just give us uh, just a, a short one on what these racehorses have done for you and uh, why you're here tonight. Well, they've done, uh, geez, since I was two years old, uh, I believe I started getting on horses. And uh, in my whole life, uh, all I've ever wanted to do is be a, be a jockey. And uh, to get the opportunity to ride some of the great horses that I've gotten the opportunity to ride, just to ride a horse, period, has just been incredible. I'm getting close to uh, 5,000 uh, wins here coming, well, six away right now. And they've, uh, they've done so much to me for me. And... Uh, just so Bonnie knows right now, when I, when I hit it, uh, you know, I'm going to give a dollar back uh, for every race that I've won. So Yo. you'll be getting a check. So. That's how much they mean to me. Joe Talamo, uh, you were what people considered an overnight sensation uh, coming from Louisiana. Started off on fire at the fairgrounds. That's when people took notice. Came out here to Southern California. Uh, and it was overnight sensation. And uh, if you can just tell a little bit about your background and coming out here to California and what these racehorses mean to you. Yeah, I mean, kind of like what Mike said, I grew up around horses since I, since I was a baby. And uh, when I was seven or eight, I, I wanted to be a jockey just like these three. And I uh, never thought I'd be sitting here with them, definitely. But, uh, but no, I mean, they've, they've given me really everything I have. Uh, you know, a house, car, with, you know, whatever, basically all the luxuries we have. And uh, I mean, they're, they're, it's hard to explain the, the feeling we get when, uh, when you ride them, especially when you win a race, whether it's a $10,000 claim or a stake race. I mean, it, it, the feeling never gets old. And we're, uh, we're definitely blessed to have them. And, and I mean, as a jockey trainer or owner, I mean, I think they're the reason we're here. You know, and that's why the, uh, the racetrack goes around. It's all because of the horses. <laughs> Kayla, you come from Australia. Um, into a, a new country where uh, female jockeys in Australia, a lot of other countries, and even on the East Coast have had much more success than what they've had here on the West Coast. And a lot of top riders have come to the West Coast and left with their tail between their legs. It's uh, started out a bit of a struggle. 
and things are heating up for you, you're uh, making a name for you, you've won on a lot of long shots over the last couple of years, and uh, tell us about that transition and um, your love for the thoroughbred. Okay. Well, coming from Australia where there's half girls and half boys riding, it was really hard for me to try and break in here compared to Australia where I started it all and, and had the girls rolling. But um, coming here, I just looked to improve every horse that I rode on. And if people could notice a difference in, in a bad horse, just being happier and wanting to run that couple lengths better, it made all the difference to me. So seeing horses just being happy here was, you know, it meant just as much as winning to me. So um, yeah, I'm just grateful to still be here and to have the opportunity to win now. <laughs> Jack Vanberg, Hall of Fame trainer, had to deal with uh, the frustration of maybe, uh, I, I would say, the best race horses of the last 40 years in gate dancer and not <laughs> trying to figure out <laughs> what's that look for. <laughs> trying to get the best out of him and then being uh, uh, fortunate enough to be the trainer of Al Sheba and, I, I swear to God, one of the most lovable, lovable guys I've ever met in my life, but uh, probably the biggest advocate of retired racehorses, making sure that these horses have somewhere to go, that they're loved, that they have another vocation. And uh, Jack Vanberg, tell us, tell us about that good stuff. Well, uh Garrett's like this, I didn't have hair until I rode you and Mike Smith. <laughs> and I pulled it all out. <laughs> Mike, Mike come to Exarbon many years ago. <laughs> he was still wet behind the ears, but I just, I love horses. I grew up around horses from the time I could walk, I rode. And, and uh, I don't think there's a better friend than horses. And if you treat them right, and do right by them. Uh, some of them are like people, they will lie to you, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's not a many of them who lie to you as people do, I can tell you that. And I just want to see them all have a happy home and be taken care of. And, and I'll say this about Gary, he worked Al Sheba before we went to the Kentucky Derby and told me when he came back and working him that day, he said, Jack, I'll sign a contract and ride him in any race for all his life. He said he's the only horse that throwed me behind the saddle at the quarter pole when I chirped to him. And I've always admired Gary because he knew how much that horse could run sitting on him one time. So, but it's just what we do for these horses, what the enjoyment they bring to us, what the enjoyment they bring to these riders here, the owners, the trainers, and everything, and what we can do for them and take care of them when they're retired is one of the greatest things that's happened in this country, I can tell you that. Thank you. Hey, Gary. Gary. Hey, Gary, I, I just wish Jack would have treated his jockeys as well as he treated his horses. <laughs> would all be at your barn in the morning instead of trying to duck you all the time. Hold on. <laughs> all right. Yeah, the, the, we'll let the games begin here in a second. And it, it's obvious to me that the moderator is, is sitting right here right now and love this guy like nobody else. It's also obvious that uh, Van Berg figured out what uh, it took a lot of other people a long time to figure out that uh, I was an actor. He didn't believe anything I was telling about Al Ashibi. He didn't give me the contract. But anyhow, thanks, Jack. <laughs> Lapeet Pinkai, uh, the guy in this room that is set on more great horses than this lineup right here ever did. And Mikey has set on some good ones. Uh, I've set on some good ones. Joe's set on some good ones. Kayla's going to oh sit God. on some great ones. Um, but I don't know how to introduce him more other than uh, I've never seen a guy happier doing 
what he's doing right now, and that's just uh, coming to events like these and promoting thoroughbred race, uh, horse racing in the way that he is, showing his love for the sport and his love of the, uh, the thoroughbred and, and what happens to them uh, after they are no longer needed on the racetrack. Say something. That's how he was in the room before he went out and won a million-dollar race, too. Just kind of staring at the wall. Funny thing about it is I didn't even want to be a jockey, you know? <laughs> I want to be a baseball player. <laughs> I, want to be, I want to be a boxer. And, um, you know, it goes to show you that uh, when, you, um, when you put your mind, in, in your mind to something and, and you work hard enough, you can be successful, you know, in, in anything. And that's what I did. I went to the track and everybody told me I was going to be too, too big to be a jockey. And, and I made up my mind I was going to be a jockey. And it, and it was hard because I had to find my way all, all throughout my career. But I, uh, I was always uh, trying very hard and concentrating and, uh, you know, I was very successful and that's one of the examples that I give the, uh, young, the young kids, you know, that uh, everything they set up their mind to do, if they try hard enough and they are responsible, they, they're going to they're gonna be successful. And uh, that's my advice to them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lafitte. If you notice, there's an empty microphone here tonight. Nick Nolte had volunteered. Turn your damn phones off. Wait, no, nah, I'm only kidding. It's probably my own. Um, Nick Nolte was going to be here tonight. And uh, Nick Nolte playing Walter Smith in the HBO series Luck. Um, and people can say who he's supposed to be, what he's supposed to be, uh, what he's doing. And... I can tell you that he spent about a year and a half with the guy sitting next to me right here. And if you know Jack Vanberg, he's portraying him very well right now. And he's got an Alasheba in his barn that nobody believes is Alasheba right now. But uh, Nick couldn't make it tonight, a uh, little down under the weather. He's got a film on Tuesday, and he sends his apologies and... Uh, he's fallen in love with this sport as uh, well as many of the cast, crew, everyone involved with luck. They've fallen in love with this sport. And uh, once again, he apologizes for not being here. Um, I'd like to start things off with a little banner here before we do a Q&A. Lafitte, I got a question for you. The one day that uh, we were at Santa Anita, and <clears throat> I think it was, I don't know, it was a $75,000 overnight stake. It wasn't a big deal, but it didn't matter to any of us. You wrote, went out and rode every race as if it was a million dollars. We sat and we watched you studying your form. Uh, you'd just come back from riding a race, and you walked out of the jocks room, and you didn't have a helmet on. You walked all the way out to the paddock before, and I think I was stood behind the corner. I said, don't tell him. Don't tell him. <laughs> well, I used to do things like that all the time, you know, because <laughs> I, I was always concentrating. I was always uh, trying to, um, thinking about why, what I did wrong in the race before, or what I'm going to do next in the next race, and I, my mind was always thinking about horses, you know, horses, so... Sometimes I went out with no helmet, and sometimes they, they, I remember one time in, at Hollywood Park, um, I went out to the number five horse, and I didn't even row in the race. You know, I was so embarrassed. I see, I see a jockey running there, and I'm saying, like, what are you doing here? You know, and I said, <laughs> I said oh, shit. <laughs> so there was one time when I went to the track, and I rode my horses, and I finished, and I went home, and I went home, and I had my wife no home. I said, what the hell is my wife? I left it at the track, you know? <laughs> that happened like twice, you know, so. So I was really in trouble. So. 
And the thing, tell him about that. He used to always take these five or ten minute naps every time yeah. before a race. So he put his little alarm. Yeah. He always had a little alarm, and he strapped it yeah. to his boot or something. Beep, beep, so one day, beep, yeah. Beep, <laughs> so one day the bell rang. It was time for us to go outside. And he's he got a little alarm on his boot. No one told him. So we're all sitting in the gate. All of a sudden, beep beep. He's trying to shut that alarm. That's a true story. I was no, the <laughs> I remember one time I had the alarm in my boots because I t used to take like a 15 or 20 minute nap before the races. So I forgot the alarm and I walked in the, I went and rode my horse, you know, I got on my horse and going to the, to the gate in the post parade. And I can't remember if it was you or somebody said, hey, your alarm is in the boot. <laughs> so I go and say, oh, I put, it, I put him inside here, you know. <laughs> so now when I go in the gate, Stupid alarm start ringing, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm trying to shut it off. <laughs> that is that is a true story. And from that day on, when he took that thing and put it behind the saddle, from then on, I suspect that there was something else in that alarm clock. <laughs> yeah, but, um, we had a lot of fun, though. I I uh, I, I enjoy being in the jock room. It was my second home for me, and I couldn't. You know, in my later, in my latest year in my career, I enjoy being in the jock room and, and riding better because uh, I was having a good time. My diet was better. I discovered how to keep my weight down better, and uh, I just was eating a lot of um, health food and, and things like that. And I just couldn't wait to go in the in the jock room and start my program and and do whatever I, whatever I had to do. You know, until I until I had that spill and retire, but, uh, and that's what I always tell people too, you know, that uh, it's very important the, the, the food that you eat, nutrition is very important in your life, and that's what I always tell the young jockeys now, when they want some kind of advice about nutrition, about eating, I always tell them, you have to eat something in the morning, don't go without breakfast, it's very important, and, and uh, I just talked to, uh, not too long ago, with this kid, uh, uh, Flores, uh, Iwan Flores. That's one. And yeah. It's, yeah, well, I gave him some tips, you know, about what to eat, and I'm telling you, he's riding really, really good. So, and I, <laughs> and, 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 but the, the good thing about it is that uh, after I talked to him, you know, I went, I went home, and the, the, um, my phone rang, and he was him. I said, listen, tell me again, what is it that you were eating? What, what should I do? What? You know, like, he really cares about it, and he's doing good, and that kid's going to do good for a long time, you know, and I hope he, he keeps, Keeps it up. Well done, Lafitte. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're just going to go down the line here. And to take myself out of the picture and in the picture at the same time, Jack, tell him about the uh, 55 Chevy down the washboard road. Uh, that's one well, day Gary rode a horse for me. And I didn't look, but the owners were about two steps behind me. Walking down, I walked up to the horse on the saddle. I said, Gary, what happened? He said, I'll tell you this much. He felt like a 55 Chevy on a washboard road. <laughs> I looked over, and they were two steps behind me. I like to have a heart attack. <laughs> I said, Gary, keep your comments to yourself till we get back by ourselves, will you please, from now on? That wasn't the half of it. I, got, I ran second, beating the nose. It was the best race that the Philly had run up to that point in time. I didn't know those were the owners standing behind Jax's. By the way, how do you know what a 55 Chevy down a washboard road uh, feels like? And I said, I owned one in high school. <laughs> Kayla, give us something, uh, some antidote when you, when you came over here, a, a difference or anything funny that's happened in the jocks room, if oh, you've got funny? one. Yeah. Funny. Uh, I'm really stuck right now, but I bet you somebody... Somebody could tell me something funny that I've said on national TV, maybe. Let's hear it. When in a race <laughs> is better than sex. <laughs> that, that's all I got. <laughs> well done, Joe. <laughs> and everybody knows that's that a I winner said so that. far. <laughs> I watched that with my grandparents. <laughs> We'll move right along now, Joe. <laughs> no, stick with her. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 
Uh, that's the funniest thing I've got, but I mean, I've been lucky in races, I can say that. I mean, I've had, a, um, I think I ran fourth, just beating a nose for third one time when I was side saddling a horse, both legs on one side, um, the saddle slipped and it pulled me over and I, I had one leg down here and one leg up here and I was coming around the turn, I'm thinking, you know, I should move out of the way so everyone can go through and be safe. And then I thought, you know what, I might run third. I think I might even win it. <laughs> so I hit the horse, right, like three times. And I hit it and my saddle goes all the way around and I'm, I'm hanging on the side of the horse. I'm thinking, oh, no. I actually swung back on, rode it bare back to the wire and I kicked it like a cowgirl. <laughs> the, the, the awesome horse, he kept trying. He tried so hard. But, um, yeah, he got beat at nose for third. <laughs> That's funny too, right? Yeah. They're laughing. Yeah, and the antidote to this story is... Uh, try, try, uh, try. Try, try, try. Oh, never give up. <laughs> exactly right. I know there's some. I young should have never doubted here. myself. <laughs> some young folks here, but here's the deal: uh, winning a race is better than sex. <laughs> and you got lucky once. You need to get lucky more often, girl. Uh, you know, uh, I can't even say it, <laughs> but <laughs> when you want something so bad, right? You just can't get it. <laughs> you just try, you put so much effort into it and then all of a sudden, okay, you get a winner. I'm not talking about the other thing. <laughs> that, <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I haven't even done it. I'm, I'm a sweet innocent. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Just keep trying and once you... <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> well done, Kayla. Thanks, Thank Gary. Oh, keep, keep going, keep going. Do tell them, Yes, sir. Does anybody understand what you're saying all the time out there? On I the doubt it. I really don't think so. Do what? Uh, I asked him about a horse the other day, and he goes, hey, Mike. I says, hey, Joe, what about this horse I ride? Man, I see don't you, talk I about see you, this. I see you rode him last time. He goes, you know, Mike, that horse a platter. I said, a platter? I said, what? what's a platter? He said, you know, a platter. A horse just kind of keeps on going. I said, you mean a plotter? Yeah, a plotter. He goes, <laughs> Yeah, that was funny, Mike. <laughs> this actually goes on all day. This is why I had to retire. My stomach hurt when I walked out the paddock. Everybody thought I was in a good mood. My cheeks hurt. No, they thought I was in a bad mood. Man, the guy's frowning. I was locked up. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell us something funny. Huh? Your turn, Mike. You're the comedian. Who, me? No, oh, Mike's... No, Mike, go ahead. No, every Who's day the jerk, he never stops, man. He just talks and talks and talks. All of a sudden, he gets up here, and you don't want to talk. This is funny. This is right, funny. Elizabeth, you right? I'm bad with speeches. I... <laughs> what happened to you? What, uh, well, what you want me to talk about? Something funny? Tell him how you got that poor kid today. Uh, you won his first race today, and you broke eggs and all uh, kinds of oh, stuff in a bucket. Oh, yeah, yeah. that was fun. Um, Lil Koa, he won today. K bar. He K -bar said Koa. Little Koa because nobody can say his first name right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's because Joe's not the baby in the room anymore. Yeah, no, that's kind of sad. I used to be the youngest. Now I, I feel like I'm 50, you know, so <laughs> it's not that good. But no, we, uh, we made a little concoction for him today to initiate him. What was in it, Mike? It, it had uh, six it. eggs in it. <laughs> not over easy. They were, they were right in there. Uh, what else was in there? Tabasco, shaving cream. We put... We put hair gel, that way it could stick on him. A little hairspray. No, no. And then we threw it on him, so that was Not pretty you fun. Pilot. When he won his Not first you race. Pilot. There wasn't no black dye? No, they didn't paint No, him. David did that. Hey, they, Vato did that. <laughs> it got, yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say this, but he did something with shoe polish. Just on, just on his leg. It was, it was, <laughs> but no, it was fun. Speaking of, speaking of Vato, I'll tell a story that, that, that happened. This is, this is a swear to you, a true story. And, Gary was, was still riding at the time, and it was a four-horse field, and it was uh, on the grass going a mile and eighth, I believe it was, and there wasn't much speed in the race. Tyler Bays, Gary, me, and David Flores were in the race. So they, Bato sits right in, we call him Bato's name's Flores, David Flores, but he sits right in between me and Gary. So Gary just looked over at me and says, you know, there ain't much speed in here. Will you be my huckleberry? You know, in other words, will I make the pace? So I said, sure, I'll, I'll be your huckleberry. 
And I said, and if you're on my inside, you know, just, I said, what's the password, you know? It's just playing around, and David, he's just listening. David just said they're listening. We're just playing. Media. So uh, Gary says, well, well, what's the password? I said, oh, that's a good one. Well, what's the password? He said, well, that's what I asked you. What's, I said, what's the password? He goes, ride, you know. So Vato's sitting there listening, you know. So we go out to ride the race, and I'm going to make paces. So me and Tyler Bays are kind of heading, heading. Vato's to my inside, and Gary's right behind us both, you know. So we're getting about the threes pole, and <laughs> Vato drives up inside of us, man. He's got some horse. He's looking for a way out. So all of a sudden, he goes, hey, Mike, ride. <laughs> I said, <laughs> this is a true story. Behind, he goes, what? I said, oh, I ain't letting him out. He goes, hey, hey, wait, ride. <laughs> I said, what's the password? He goes, right. And David go, and Gary goes, what? And so, man, I just said, poor guy, man. I, I stuck him in there. Next thing you know, they both run by me, and, and David gets beat about that, 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 that far. You beat him about that far, and we're galloping out, and he's screaming at me. Man, I was yelling, yelling the password, right, right, right. And Gary rides up next to me. He goes, what's the password? And then Vata goes, right. Yeah. 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 That's a true story. True story. Hey. Now, any questions out there for this great group of panelists, please uh, raise a hand. We got an extra microphone out back right there. Uh, hi, my name is Brandon Rice. I'd like to just make a comment to Mr. Smith. Uh, what an incredibly redemptive ride you had at the Breeders' Cup this year with Ross Meyer after Congratulations on an incredible ride at the Breeders' Cup this year. You made a lot of people I was with a, a lot of money. Thank uh, you, thank you. It, that took some of the hurt away from the year before, so it helped. It was a beautiful thing to see, it really was. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, the first horse I ever invested in uh, was a, uh, a, a filly out of War Chant, or by War Chant, I'm sorry, out of uh, a very nice mare. And I thought that War Chant, the move that that horse made in the Breeders' Cup mile, was the most impressive move I've ever seen a horse make. Uh, I also thought with the pedigree, that horse had the best chance to be a superstar stallion that maybe could have came across in the last 10 years. Were you surprised that War Chant didn't make that step to be the stallion as quality as he was as a racehorse? Um, he was uh, cut out to be a great stallion as so many are. Uh, unfortunately, there's so many out there right now, and there's only so many good mares that get to these stallions, and they're made in the first two or three years, and the development is different on these uh, sires and their offspring, but they generally give them about three years for their offspring uh, to be really ex successful. And if there's not a lot of success in those first couple of years, and if they don't go to the right people, uh, who know what their past is. By the way, War Chant, uh, there was a, a um, son of Sunday Silence bred to a mare by War Chant that was a good winner today and paid a good price for <laughs> Neil Drysdale going a flat mile on the turf. But uh, my point being that uh, the opportunity for success uh, with these stallions at the highest level is generally accomplished within the first five years. And um, fortunately or unfortunately for the commercial business, um, fortunate for the people that don't have a lot of money out there, there's a lot of diamonds in the rough. But yes, that finish of War Chant uh, was probably one of the most exciting and the fastest last quarter mile that I ever uh, rode on, on the turf, and that was at Churchill Downs in uh, 2001, I believe. So uh, thanks for the observation. Absolutely. I have a question about how you guys maintain your weight, being that I weigh more than all of you. <laughs> I know you guys, um, it takes a lot of endurance and strength and energy to do your job. And I'm wondering if you like eat Sunday night through Tuesday and sit in the sauna on Wednesday all day. Well, I, I, I um, in later in my career, I learned how to maintain my, my weight better by eating a lot of nutritious food, you know, like uh, uh, apples and, and grains, not, you know, very low in... Uh, 
the carbohydrate very low, you know, like rice and all those things. You have to cut that, that off. But protein, you have to have some protein three times a day and things like that. And the, you have to watch the calories too, you know, and exercise. So is weight a constant struggle for all of you all the time? It was for me because I, I you know, if I, let, I, I still don't eat more than 1,000 calories a day. You know, because I'm used to, and I like it. I like the way I feel. If I let myself go, I go to 100, I weigh 130 pounds now. And I, I will weigh 150 easy, you know. <laughs> if I eat, you know, like hamburgers and things like that. But, you know, <laughs> you probably don't know this, you know, most of you. I never He's ate He's burning a lot of calories, taking yeah. the girls, too, to check. I have, ne <laughs> I have never ate a hamburger in my life. Oh. I had a bite of it, but I never ate one. Or a hot dog. You know, and I, believe me, I, 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 I you know, some, it's nice to taste it, it tastes good. I chew it and spit it out, you know, I don't, I don't swallow it, you know, and that's it. And well, Pete, I want to tell you something. He had probably, before he got on the nutritional diet he did in his later years in writing, he used to take a peanut, and if you don't think it's tough, try it. I've tried it over and over and over. Take a peanut and suck on it to get all the oil out of that peanut and spit the peanut out. And I, for a long time, he did that riding, and I'm going to tell you, I've tried it over and over and never did get by chewing. I always chewed the peanut up. Of course, that's how I got the size I am, but he's he very, very well disciplined. One of the most difficult things are, are for an active jockey are nights like tonight and uh, entertaining. You win a big race, somebody wants to take you out to dinner for celebration. You see somebody eating a... Uh, uh, a nice fillet or a T-bone or a nice piece of lobster or whatever, and you have to do this. We have no season. It's, it's year-round uh, that you've got to maintain the weight, and you've not only got to maintain the weight, but you've got to maintain the sanity to go out on the racetrack the next day when you're hungry after watching somebody eat a surf and turf. <laughs> I think that's right, but... At the same time, I think uh, the longer you do it, the, the more you get to know your body. And everybody is different. Like, um, some people can handle more exercise than others, and some people get more tired from exercising, and therefore maybe you're more hungry and you shouldn't have exercised that much. And you can overthink it, but at the same time, I think you just have to be smart and be healthy. And it's pretty simple, but, yeah, you just have to get in a good routine. Yeah, that, that's, that's very true. You, you got to learn by yourself what, what's, what works for you, you know, and if you pay attention, you, you, you'll find out. Joe still eats Cheetos. <laughs> Lafitte, you want to go to In-N-Out after? <laughs> <laughs> Any other I don't questions? Think so. I'm, I, I'm, I, I just, you know, I, I don't eat a, a whole lot. I'll, I'll have anything I want. I just don't eat a lot of it. And if I want dessert, I just eat a bite or two of it. So I don't ever deprive myself of something. Then I crave everything a lot. And, and I exercise a whole lot, you know, just about every day. But if I want a steak, I have a steak. I just cut what I'm going to eat off of it, and I smash the rest or put something on it so I don't eat it. And just, I just have that little portion. And you'd be surprised on, on how, how much people really overeat. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, we got a question. I'm sorry. I'm Jack. <laughs> yeah. The question was uh, she wanted to know what time everybody gets up and do you need an alarm to get up or do you just wake up at that time? And I think the best one to ask is the horse trainer who's up earlier and up longer than any jockey ever has been? Well, I don't know about that, but I get up between 3 and 4, 3.30 and 4 o'clock every morning, seven days a week. And, uh, but I still use alarm clock because I have a good, clear conscience and I can sleep well, you know what I mean? <laughs> Some of these riders, uh, their conscience might not be too clear and they lay awake hey, all night. But he used to sneak in. He used to sneak into his house at three o'clock in the morning. Was <laughs> he kidding me? But anyway, it. Uh, all these guys are out in the morning when they're riding. Joe, Kayla, I see them every morning out working horses. And they'll be on the racetrack a lot of them at five thirty themselves. So most of them live on this side of town. I'll see them over at Hollywood, 
Gary, when he was riding, and Lafitte, they were always out there in the morning riding. But you get used to getting up in the morning, and, and uh, it's kind of a... I feel guilty result. when the sun comes up and I'm laying in bed. I can't do it. It's yeah, too I pretty. Up, I, I get up early, too. I get up about 6 o'clock every morning. And, um, and, and, I mean, without the alarm, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm just used to get up, getting up in the morning. I, I've eased on up to about uh, 6.25. <laughs> and I feel guilty about getting up at 6.25. I feel half the day's been wasted. Uh, like Kayla said, if you, if you get up and the sun's up, you've wasted half the day, the most beautiful part of the day, watching the thoroughbreds train. And I go out almost every morning when I'm in town, unless there's a reason I can't go out. That's my life. That's what I love. I love watching these horses uh, get ready in the morning to see which riders are working the hardest and, and the whole progression of the whole sport. You ever see me out there, GD? <laughs> I get up at 6. I look at the clock. I'm you're, like, damn, you're, that's early, man. Oh, I roll man, over and go back to bed. <laughs> I don't get up. Joe. Joe. Now, he doesn't see me out there. You, you've been tweeting, and your agent said, oh, no. Hold on, let me tweet he, right he's now. At Hollywood, <laughs> he's at Hollywood Park, and the guy's at Hollywood Park. He said, where's Joe? Oh, he's over at Santa Anita. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding, though. No, that I, actually, I, I, have a very, I have a very busy schedule. Um, I, I usually go to boat tracks in the morning. Uh, for instance, this morning, I was at Hollywood Park. I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning. I, uh, I worked. I worked nine horses at Hollywood, then I came back to Santa Anita to work one on the turf, and then I, I uh, rode eight today. And then tomorrow I have about the same schedule. I have to go to Hollywood early, work about five or six horses, and then uh, come back to Santa Anita and work probably two or three. So it's a, it's a, for me, it's, a, it's real busy during the week. So that's a, I think Mike works that in a month. So we'll see. <laughs> I haven't worked that <laughs> about a year. That's a lot of work, man. I used to come out and get on Zenyatta. Uh, <laughs> that was at 9 o'clock. <laughs> hey, Jack, how about yeah, when you... was 9.30. <laughs> hey, Jack, Jack, how, how about when you called me at 5.30 in the morning, then you denied it? 5.30 in the morning on a Saturday, I get a phone call. Hey, hey. <laughs> anyway. You got Richie the new book? I said, no, it's down in the car. Well, God damn it, go down and get your new book. And call me back. <laughs> so I go down at 5.40 in the morning on a Saturday when there's no draw. I get the book. I call you back at 5.40. I said, Jack. He said, yeah. I said, it's Richie. He goes, yeah. I go, what'd you want? I didn't call you. I, I said, Jack. The call away. I said, Jack, you didn't call me? You said, no, I didn't call you. So I let it go about three, four days. I came to Hollywood Park. I said, Jack, the damnedest thing happened Saturday morning. My phone rang at 5.30, and a guy said to me, God damn it, get your book. I got my book. I called you. He goes, Richie, I didn't have the heart to tell you. You got Pedroza. I wanted Pinky. I was calling Bob Meldall. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see the names in the book, and I called you by mistake. And then you had the nerve <laughs> to lie about it for four days. That's a true story. That he works hard. Story. That's my agent. I, I felt so bad he called me up. And I was trying to get Pinkay. <laughs> See how mean he was to his jocks? And I had That's what his I'm number you when he answered the phone. I, I, had to, I couldn't say I got the wrong number. It says, go get your book. <laughs> and you sleep well at night? <laughs> you clear <laughs> was, no conscience. Because as an agent, so after they spun me a few times, I, I'll tell you the one about Jim Pagram, <laughs> Martin Garcia's agent. He's rather large. <laughs> So one day I said to him, I said, I'm going to tell you one thing, Pregram, in my heyday, and you spun me like you did, you had to get a goddamn good whipping from me. He said, in your heyday, I wouldn't have spun you that three and five. I had a blinking light in between it. He said, it wasn't 35 to one. I wouldn't have spun you then. So I had to shut up. <laughs> Anybody else? Don't forget your skincare. Are we lose an hour of sleep tonight? Oh, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, uh, from the jockey's perspective, how much handicapping do you guys actually do um, before a race, in terms of looking at the pace complexion, who the competition is in the race, and do you in any way adjust your riding style on a horse that you're already familiar with based on who else is in the race, or you just ride the horse based on what you know? And secondly, um, a question that maybe applies to Jack and the jockeys as well. 
do you really take instructions from the trainers? Is it on a trainer by trainer basis? Or you do, do you just do what Sometimes. comes natural? Sometimes if the trainer does that formal enough, then you just go with it because you know that they know what they're talking about. Other times you, you have to trust your out. instincts more and do your form because maybe they just leave it to you. I'm going to ride you more often, Kay. Like, see right now, you might listen to me. I can see that now. Had a girl. I'm confidence in you. Up here for thinking. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. Answer. You're handicapped. You also have to ride I, the jockeys I'll as well as the horses. I'll tell you right now, if I were to handicap as much when I was riding as I do now as an analyst, I might have won 7,000 races instead of 5,003. But no, I, I would, I would uh, basically, the way I handicapped a race or would put a race out in my mind is if I was riding a horse for the first time and that horse had not been running well, if I had specific instructions from a Jack Vanberg or certain trainers, uh, I would listen to what they wanted. But the good trainers, they'd basically tell you this horse likes it on the inside he, or, or he'll run on the inside. He loves it on the outside. He may lug out with you a little bit. He's going to lean in with you, this and that. I wanted to know what these horses' habits were, but if the horse hadn't been performing well, I may try something on the horse that he had never been ridden like before. One of my favorite things was when I'd go out in the paddock and Jack Vanberg would tell me, this is a lazy SOB. Make sure you strap him every stride from the quarter pull. Well, first of all, towards the end of my career, I wasn't fit enough to ride one that far that hard. So now I, I find out. I, I'd immediately, I'd say, well, this horse has had the hell beaten out of him probably his last 20 races. I ain't going to touch him with the whip today. And you know what? About halfway through the stretch, that horse would start running with you. And he may run second or third that day, and it was a big improvement on how he'd been uh, running. But you would pull up after a race, and that was a happy horse. And I'd come back, and I'd beg him. I'd say, please, put me on him uh, next time you run. You didn't hit him. No, I know I didn't today, but I will next time, boss. Well, I never hit him the next time. And they'd win by five because they weren't getting the hell beat out of him. They're like... And this guy's not hitting me. I like this. So, uh, no, it just depended on the guy and, and what the horse's style was. You look, you've got a look of shock and awe on your I face. I am a little hey, shocked. Hey, hey, Gary, I tried that with Jack one time. I said, well, I chirped to him. He said, well, if I want a canary, I ought to put a canary on him. He said, <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I go... What See, the hell were you, I said, I what were you doing so far back? He said, well, I was chirping to him. I said, I ought to put a canary on him if I want a goddamn something to chirp to him, not you. He said, I chirp. Yeah, you got to smooch. You got to... Well, you ain't never walked by the men or the girls and go... Like that, for Christ's <laughs> sakes. That's when you're chirping. Mike was good at that, but he just was bashful with the horses, that's all. <laughs> Aratoga, he was really good in that place. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm... Since a lot of us really love the horses, we were just wondering if there are any horses that were really special to any of you. Every horse. There's Thank nothing you, else Kayla. to say. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No special relationships, any that you really remember? I, I thought Zenyatta would only run for me. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I, I truly believe that, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did Vato win three on her? Shut up, Joe. <laughs> uh, my, my special horse, um, I, I mean, there's so many. I, I think that, that really comes to mind is probably uh, Neshoba's Key. That was my first grade one uh, winner, and she was, uh, she, she really, I, I think she was the horse that really kind of took me to, to the pinnacle where I am today. She really, um, I, I learned, I really learned how to ride a good horse when I rode her, that just to, really stayed patient, and she was a great horse to ride. And obviously, I mean, I want revenge. She was another one the year after. I was so fortunate to have two great horses back to back. I mean, they, they were about the same. You could, you just pretty much sit on them, and, and like Jack said, you just chirp to them, and off they would go. So I think those two were very special. 
Was that Carla Gaines? Yeah. The show was key? Yeah. 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 She's a good trainer. Um, I have won a stakes race. It was in Australia, though. Uh, his name was Navy Shaker. But as I say, I think every horse is awesome. I mean, they all try as hard as they can, and we look after them as much as they look after us, and um, I think they're all important. I want to know from Lafitte uh, what the best horse he thinks he've ever ridden was. Well, the, all the good ones he got to ride. This wasn't a question. The question was the uh, special horse to you, not the best horse, right? What? That horse that meant something yeah, extra I, special, I, I, and they I, all I, mean something. I had a lot of special horses, especially Phillies. Phillies were good to me. <laughs> Very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I had many good Phillies. Too much testosterone My, to get along with the guys? <laughs> My favorite horse of all time was uh, Silver Charm. He wasn't the best horse that I ever rode, but he did for me what every cheap horse, when I say cheap horse, not in love and not in uh, the size of their heart because an $8,000 horse could give me as big a thrill on a Wednesday as winning a million dollar race on a weekend until I went to the bank the following Thursday. But... Um, <laughs> the horse that would go out there and just give you his all every time. And you would get that on a, on a Wednesday afternoon and maybe the fourth race, a $10,000 claimer, that you could tell, I mean, I'm asking him for everything or her, and they're giving me everything. And that's what Silver Charm, he was the epitome of a cheap horse. He was a blue-collar blue worker that he beat horses that... Uh, in the morning, he would never give me a clue. He'd work in the morning like he was a $10,000 horse, but he'd find that little bit of extra like any great athlete would on the Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And even the lower class horses, uh, those were the horses that I loved and, and gave me the biggest thrill. I think I think a, a firm and a, a firm was a very, very special horse, and uh, I the thing that I like the best about him that uh, he was very smart. He's the smartest horse I ever rode, and uh, I could he had a lot of speed, or you can take him back, and you, I could do anything. And when he saw when he saw the competition, and you ask, believe me, he'll go. And um, almost in most of the races that I rode him, I was so sure that I was going to win. You know, it's a good feeling when. You ride a horse like that. And um, Bayacoa is the best filly I rode. She, she has speed, and boy, she, she could really, really run. And, and there were some races that uh, she run that, believe me, I don't care. She would have beat everybody, anybody that day. And uh, especially for me, is swell because he gave me my only Kentucky Derby, you know, something that I will never forget. And uh, I think. Uh, Every rider should have that opportunity, you know, to ride a, a horse like him and, and win that race because that's, that's, that's the greatest thing that ever uh, that I ever experienced. And I know any jockey will tell you the same thing. The one that can talk it ever will tell you the same thing. Thank you. All right, well, up. Oh. She's been trying to, yeah, I'm sorry. Honey. I think you just answered my question that you were going to. Of all the races that you've run, I want to know what is the most uh, most special race that stands out of all the races that you've ever That was it, the Kentucky Derby, you know? When I cross the wire, I'm telling you, I, I could have just died right there. <laughs> I mean, that was something that I wanted. Ever since I came to this country, you know, I, uh, I hear about the Kentucky Derby ever since I was a little kid. And then I became a jockey. I came over here and um, <clears throat> I met Bill Shoemaker and he's won about two or three at that time. And, uh, and then I get to ride my first Kentucky Derby and my horse finished fifth. He, he kind of got hurt. And then I rode another one and another one. I said, next year, you know, next year I'll get it. And then next year kept going to eight years and 10 years, you know, and it's a tough feeling when you go into the race thinking that you had a chance to win and something happened and you don't win or, and about two or, th two or three of those races, I know I should have won for sure and I got bothered and it's a long trip back home because you, all the things that go through your head, like, 
I have to wait until next year to see if I ride a good horse, to see if I get lucky, you know? And then finally I won it, and it just it was a dream come true. And that's, I think that's what, one of the uh, happiest days that I, in my career, in my life, really. Real quick, <clears throat> I, uh, Wayne Lucas uh, asked me, he said, have you been in the Derby Museum? And I said, no, I haven't. It was, uh, I'm, I'm writing for him uh, Thunder Gulch, and he said, man, it's unbelievable. And I'd already won my <clears throat> first derby. And Wayne says, you got to go see the film that they have. It's a slide projection in this oval room, and, and um, I, it's beautiful. And it's from sun up to sun down after the race in Lafitte. There's this interview with him, and, and it was before he had ridden Swell that afternoon. And I'll never forget this. Um, they're interviewing him and, and said, um, do you ever pray before you race? No, I pray for safety, but I never pray to God to win a race. This afternoon, I asked for a little extra push <laughs> with that voice. And I heard it, and it just rang through my head, and it was the best motivational. I'll never, ever This afternoon, I asked for a little extra push. <laughs> and he got it. And my, I got my push that day. <laughs> just give me a little push. <laughs> That'll take too long for some of these people. For Michael Wood, if I had superstitions, I'd go crazy. No. Stay away from superstitions. What? I'm superstitious of superstitions. No. Lafitte, which, well, uh, well, are, are your <laughs> underwear inside or outside? Yeah. And, There's uh, underwear around back inside right right out. Now, Ever since I rode my first race until I, until I rode my last race, I, went, I wore my underwear inside out. <laughs> yeah. One time, and then, and then one, one time, and then one time uh, a guy, a, one, a reporter came and he asked me the question, and I, and I said, yeah, I, I wear my underwear backward. <laughs> and he says, well, how you go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> one time we were, we, were at, we were at Del Mar, and I bought these new bike pants to ride in because they had a little cushion on, on your butt. You know, I thought, oh, these are great. I, said, I was telling the feet about it. He said, oh, he said, give me a pair. So I said, all right. <laughs> You put them on backwards, you know, you can see the cushions the other way. <laughs> inside out, you put them on inside out, so you see the little cushions the other way. <laughs> they call uh, that a booty pop, I think they sell yeah. all the infomercials <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we got to move on because of the time change. Good night. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, Jack Vanberg is also uh, an accomplished auctioneer. And I'd um, like to thank everybody for being up here on this panel tonight. And uh, Jack, I'm going to let you take over at what you do second best, being an auctioneer. Oh, but, 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 but. I don't know. After <laughs> some of them horses you wrote for me, you might say, this is better, I can tell you that. <laughs> but, 